Anyways, today is a great day. We are going to be starting off a new series, studying what Jesus taught us on the Sermon on the Mount. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to save us. God, that you came and you didn't just save us from our sin, Lord. God, you ushered in a new era in the kingdom. So, Lord Jesus, I pray, God, today as we learn how to live in that kingdom, God, will you refresh our souls? Will you help us to walk faithfully in the way of the master? We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today, we're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be studying the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's chapter 5 through 7. And as we turn there, this series is called About Life in the Kingdom. And, you know, sometimes when we hear the phrase kingdom of God, you know, that can have a lot of different meanings to us. Sometimes people just think about heaven when they think about the kingdom of God. What we don't realize is, is that Jesus, John, and the disciples said that the kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is near you when they came and preached the gospel. And Jesus is preparing us for that kingdom. So in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1 and reading through verse 2, this is what it says. It says, Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Pause right there. We look at Jesus. Jesus has his crowds of people that have been following him. As these crowds are following him, he kind of takes a moment and he kind of breaks off. It says, it says, seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain, and when he sat down, who came to him? His disciples who are following him, and they're not just part of the regular crowd. They're following him and learning to be like the master. So what we see is that the Sermon on the Mount is starting out very clearly as a sermon by Jesus to his disciples. Jesus is preparing his disciples by laying down the fundamentals of the kingdom. The disciples of Jesus are what all Christians are supposed to be. Every Christian is a disciple, learning and following to be like Jesus. But as Jesus lays down these principles, he's answering the question, what does it look like to live as a citizen of God's kingdom? God's kingdom is is basically having Jesus in your life as your king. But what does it look like? So today, as we begin our series studying the kingdom, we're going to be basically studying Christianity 101. So welcome, class, as we begin to study Christianity 101. Today's first lesson that I want us to see is a lesson of total dependence upon God. So we're going to start off, and we're going to be looking at these Beatitudes, which are verses 3 through 12. And Jesus keeps saying, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. And this phrase blessed here, it literally means blessed are you, fortunate are you, happy are you. God is blessing you. You are living a blessed life if you do these things. And that is what Jesus is laying out. Jesus is laying out these principles of a blessed life. And we're going to look at the first four in verses three through six. But all of these principles boil down and boil down with a foundational principle to starting the Christian life. And that is a desperate dependence upon God. That is foundational for every Christian. Let's think about dependence for a second. You know, think about your kids, you know, when they've bitten off more than they can chew, especially when they're like five years old. Have you ever had that moment where your five-year-old is, you know, grabs that glass bowl of full of hot soup and he just starts to carry it to the table? Have you ever had that moment where your five-year-old just starts to run with it and you're, and you're gently trying to coax them without scaring them? You're like, like, hey, how about daddy help you with that? Or, or maybe, sweetie, maybe we could come over here with that or something like that. And they just look right back at you like, Oh, no, no, I got it, as they're sloshing stuff everywhere. Now, what's, 
what's got a good chance of happening? You probably got a 70% chance of them either dropping it or spilling it or making a big mess. But, you know, God gave us our children to teach us important things about him. And I feel like sometimes in the same way, we look at God as we're trying to live the Christian life without him. And we look at him and say, no, no, I got it. I got it. But God knows that we're going to make a big mess of it without him. So that's why it's important. As Jesus teaches us Christianity 101, he starts with these simple beatitudes. Let's look at the first one in verses 2 and 3. It says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first thing I want us to see is that only spiritually poor people enter the kingdom. That's what I want us to see today. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now let's unpack this. The first thing that we need to see is that we need God's grace. Go to Luke chapter 18. As a matter of fact, as I've been studying this, it's really amazing to me how Luke 18 unpacks this verse. So turn to Luke chapter 18, and we'll start in verse 9. See, we have to come to a point where we realize that we are spiritually poor, where we realize that we are broke, that we are destitute without God's grace. If we're at a point of spiritual self-sufficiency where I feel like I'm a good person, I do good things, well, we become spiritually self-reliant. We are setting ourselves up to miss the grace of God. So look there, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus tells a parable. It says in verse 9, it says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, respected religious leader, and the other, a tax collector, viewed as scum of the earth. All right, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is laying out a principle, and it says specifically, he told this parable for those who trust in themselves that they were righteous. You see a Pharisee that acts like he's got it all together. Pharisees had to memorize huge chunks of scripture. They were experts in God's law. And this Pharisee is praying and talking to God, pridefully thanking him that he's so perfect and he's so wonderful. Yet the one whom God makes right, the one whom God justifies, is the dirty, sinful tax collector who recognizes his brokenness and comes to God with a broken heart and says, Have mercy on me, a sinner. Notice his prayer was less eloquent. Notice he didn't have anything to bring to the table, but he came to God crying out, for mercy. We can't get to heaven unless we're made right with God, unless we've been justified. The person who gets justified here is not the self-righteous man. It is the man who is broken and acknowledges his sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. James 4.6, God says, James says, but he, God gives more grace, therefore it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. In order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you will never get in by showing a merit badge of all your successes and all of your deeds. The only way we get in is if we're made right with God. 
But before that can happen, we have to acknowledge that we are spiritually poor. That without him, we'll never make it. And I think it no accident that all of these little sections of scripture are together. Look at verse 15 through 17 of Luke. Right after this, we have little children trying to come to Jesus. Luke 18, 15 through 17, it says, Now they were bringing even infants to him, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them. For such belong, to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now this verse gets easily misunderstood. I think most of us growing up would look at this verse or even may have heard it taught this way. That in order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to have the faith of a child. I don't see faith anywhere in the context of that scripture. And what else is interesting? Now, faith is required. Make no mistake. But this scripture is sandwiched between the story we just read about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the very next story is the rich young ruler who had it all together. That context gives us a clue to what Jesus means. Why did they want to stop the kids from coming to Jesus to begin with? Any guesses? Because the little children were annoying? It's because the little children were at the very lowest rank in their society. Little children had not yet earned their place. They had not yet done anything to merit their position. And in this day, it was very much a meritocracy. As a matter of fact, if you were rich and successful, you were assumed, and you were a good person, you were assumed to be blessed by God. And you were of higher rank and higher importance. But the disciples, the culture of their day, were like, get these children out of the way. Let the more important people come to Jesus. And so Jesus tells them, he says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The context, the last guy, we just saw a Pharisee and a worthless guy. The worthless guy got redeemed. In the next part that we're going to read, the rich young ruler, we're going to see the rich young ruler miss it, even though everybody assumed he was blessed. You come to God like a child in this culture, it means you come to God admitting, I have nothing to offer. I've got nothing to merit worth or merit you saving me. God, I simply just come. Will you please save me? This is being poor in spirit. I bring nothing to the table. And we have to depend completely upon God in faith. Look at verse 18 of Luke chapter 18. It says, And a young ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have. Distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, see, we've left our homes and we followed you. And he said to him, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who were not received many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. What is Jesus saying? The next thing we have to see is we depend completely upon God in faith. Here's the deal. 
He was a rich. Jesus makes a comment in verse 25. He says, it's easier for Campbell to go through eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples immediately reply, well, then who can be saved? Their standard, again, if you were a good guy and young ruler, this is likely a young ruler of a synagogue. The way the synagogues worked is that they kind of had a president or a leader who was kind of in charge of organizing it. And different people would come up and preach and teach. The thing is, is that he was leading. He was a leader in his congregation. He was rich and wealthy. He was a good guy. So when Jesus says it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven, the disciples just like, well, is there hope for any of us? This again, Jesus is reversing the way they're thinking. Children are worthless. This guy had value. But what hindered this guy? What caused this guy to miss the kingdom? What caused him to miss it was that he kept trusting in his riches. Look at verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. When we are spiritually poor, there is a recognition not only of our desperate need for grace, not only that we don't have anything really to bring to the table, but we are spiritually poor and that we are utterly dependent upon God for everything in our life. This rich young ruler had a test before him. Will I trust in my riches that have become an idol in my life? That's the one commandment Jesus didn't mention to him, was idolatry. He said, will I trust in these rich? Will I trust in these riches or will I trust and put my faith in God? And Jesus had a challenge before him. He said, I challenge you, sell this, come follow me. I'm the Messiah, I'm worth following. But he's not willing to do that. He's not willing to leave the security of his riches. When we are spiritually poor and we realize the value of the kingdom before us, we're willing to say, God, I will follow you wherever and I am wholly dependent upon you and your grace to get me through this. That's why Jesus tells Peter. Peter's like, ooh, we did that. We left our stuff. I love Peter. He's like Captain Obvious. You know, <laughs> he's like, we left it, Jesus. And Jesus is like, and you will be rewarded. Because you chose me and you chose the kingdom over your personal comfort and convenience. It's not a call for every single one of us to sell all of our stuff and go be poor. My dad was a traveling businessman. God called him to witness to people on airplanes and people in the business world. But what does matter is what my father always told me. Any of this stuff could be gone in an instant. This is not what matters. What matters is seeking the Lord first. We have to have this as our foundation to live the Christian life. If we're trusting in other things, we need to be aware we may just even miss the kingdom. It's foundational. It starts there. The next thing I want us to see is that brokenness over sin and evil leads to God's comfort. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What does Jesus mean by that? Mourning over what? Mourning over our sin. Think in your heads, back to Luke 18, what we read about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Was the Pharisee even remotely grieved about his sin? No. No. He was thanking God for how great he was. Who mourned? Who grieved? Who was beating his chest broken before God? The tax collector. The tax collector got comforted. The Pharisee wasn't heard. Mourning over our own sin. James 4, after James rebukes, this rebukes this church for its worldliness, the quarreling and fighting as they were really fighting over worldly things and desires and things that they wanted. James 4, 8 through 10, he rebukes them. He tells them to repent. And he says in verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. 
Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. There's an absolutely critical thing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We have to mourn and grieve over our sin. If our sin is still a laughing matter, we are not yet ready to be comforted and restored. If we treat our sin flippantly, if we laugh at sin, if we think the brokenness of this world is no big deal, if we're not grieved by any of that, then don't expect to be comforted. Expect to be enslaved to sin. James tells him the road out is to be mourned and grieve over our sin and turn to God. That's conviction. In 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, Paul makes it very clear what godly, godly sorrow looks like. He says in verse 8, he says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you though only for a while. But as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There is a godly grief, there's a sorrow, there's a brokenness that I've sinned against God when I sin. And that's different from worldly sorrow where I'm just sad that I got caught or I'm just sad that I got consequences for my bad decision. That's worldly sorrow. People will eventually dust that off and go right back to the same sin. However, when we have godly sorrow and we are convicted at what we've done is wrong and evil, we mourn over it, then we can find the comfort of God. In Psalm chapter 51, King David, who is supposed to be a man after God's own heart, fell into really wicked sin. He saw a woman, he lusted after her, and he committed adultery with her. And to cover it up later, he had her husband put on the front lines and killed. And then God didn't let David escape with that. He sent a prophet and rebuked David, and David was convicted of his sin. And after David was humiliated and broken down because of his sin. God gave him grace when he finally repented. Psalm 51, David wrote this psalm after all those events. Here's a few excerpts for you. In verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing heart. David cries out to God, broken over his sin. And God begins to restore him. You know, they lost their first child as a result of these things, but later they have a new child and David has hope and gives thanks to God for rebuilding his life out of all the darkness that his sin had brought him. But first we have to mourn over our sin. It says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. The next thing you need to mourn over is the lost. Paul in Romans 9 Verses 1 through 3 says this when he thinks about his family and friends in his culture that are lost. He said, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Saul is so grieved about the losses of his family and friends in the Jewish nation. He wishes so badly that they would understand the gospel and believe in Christ. He said, I wish I could take their place. Paul is broken about their sin. Psalm 133, 136 says, My eyes shed streams of tears because of the people that do not keep your law. Are we broken about the lost? 
when we hear those sad stories about another family that's been destroyed or another person on the news that dies. We see the broken homes from drugs and all kinds of other sin. Does it grieve us? Does it bother us? Mark 9, 35 through 38 or 36 through 38, Jesus says this. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And when he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. You know, as I've quoted that verse, and as we say that verse, pray for God to send more laborers. The base strategy wasn't church growth. It wasn't just that our church could grow or be built or strong. It's because Jesus looked out and he saw a crowd of people that were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. I think of when I took a trip out to India to try and share the gospel with people so that God could save them and change their lives. I remember walking down the street. When I came back to America, I had such a hard time feeling bad for those who were homeless here. But I saw four and five-year-old little boys with stars and calluses on their elbows and their knees from sleeping on the hot concrete and asphalt. They didn't have a bed to lay their heads. Our world is broken. But are we grieved as we sit here and we bask in the grace of God and all the goodness He's done in our lives? Do we mourn for the brokenness of our world? Because I desire so strongly for us to see the comfort of Christ in our lives and theirs. There is coming a day where God will make all things new. And I praise God. God for that day. In Revelation 21, 1 through 4, it says, I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be for them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. God is our hope of comfort. He is the hope for this world. But as we look out and we see the families that are broken in our own community. We see the nation so desperately in need of the gospel. Dear church, are we grieved about the pain, the death, and brokenness we see just outside these doors? Will we grieve? Will we be grieved to the point of action that we respond? Will we have a passion to reach the lost in this community? Will we do whatever it takes so that God's comfort can be brought to them. Dear church family, let's mourn over the brokenness of this world, but let us seek the comfort that comes from Christ. We have people in need of that comfort. Let us bring it to them. The next thing we see in the Beatitudes is that the meek will win in the end. Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness is not to be weak and lazy. Meekness does not mean I'm a pacifist or a sissy or a wuss that I do nothing. Meekness is trusting in God rather than trying to force my own will. You know, Jesus is quoting this very close to Psalm 37. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 37. I want to show you some things. These foundational truths for our kingdom is that, you know what? 
In the end, we're depending upon God because we're poor in spirit. We are mourning and depending on God for our comfort. And we are meek and waiting on God because that is how we win in the end. That is how we inherit the earth. I'm just going to show you some excerpts from Psalm 37 because I want you to see the context of what Jesus is saying. In verses 1 through 3, the psalm says, Fret not yourself. That means worry. Fret, worry not yourself because of evildoers. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass, and they will wither like a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, and dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. Look at verse 8. It says, refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The lesson here for us, dear Christians, is that we're not to force our way into things and try and take matters into our own hands. Meekness means when we see evildoers trying to take over the land, the evildoers trying to do evil and wicked things. If God calls us to fight them or do what we have to do, we do it. But there's a temptation at times for us to take matters into our own hands. We see something not working out in the church the way, the way we want it. We see something not working out in the family the way we want it. Sometimes we get tired of waiting on God to act. And we try to take matters into our own hands. The key to the meek here who inherit the land is that they are trusting in God. It says in verse 5, it says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. I'm committing my way to the Lord. Lord calls me to speak up against evil or do something against evil, I'll do it. But I'm going to make sure that I am patiently and faithfully trusting in God's word when there's a temptation to stray off course and take matters into my own hands. Com commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. We'll find as time goes on, sometimes it's hard to wait on the Lord to act. Because he doesn't act in our timing. But I can testify to you in all my years that I have had to wait on the Lord. He has been faithful. He has been right and he has been so good. You know, I knew long ago, I got my master's degree in expository preaching in 2011. And I stayed a youth pastor at a church for all those years after that. Why? I had other friends that got their degrees and they went off and they started their churches and did their things. But God said, stay and build up this little church. And that is what I did. And you know what? By being meek and by waiting, I saw God work. The key is not for us to get impatient and to take matters into our own hands, but instead in meekness say, God, I humbly submit to your will. I humbly submit to your way. What do you want for me? What do you want for this church? What do you want for my family? Don't let it be my will, God, but yours. That is the key. Psalm 37, verse 32 says, The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. But the Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Waiting for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. And you will look on as the wicked are cut off. Down to verse 37. Mark the blameless 
and look upon the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors will altogether be destroyed, and the future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. If you struggle with this, I encourage you to just go home and read Psalm 37 through and through. But what I want you to know is that the key to meekness, the key to being able to wait upon God when it's like, I feel like I need to act. I feel like I need to do something. My spiritual experience has been this. Usually when it's something that I just want to do, want to jump in and say something, want to jump in and do something, that's when I shouldn't. Usually it's the moment where I don't want to say something and the Holy Spirit keeps convicting me, hey, you need to say something. Hey, you need to say something. That's usually the moment that's from the Lord, not the moment that comes from the flesh where I just want to jump out and say it. I have to be meek. We have to be meek and wait upon the Lord. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? This person has said something about me. What do you want me, want me to do about the situation? I see my kids acting a fool. What do you want me to do, Lord Jesus? We're meek. We remain humble. We trust in the Lord. That is a foundational Christian principle. It says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The next thing I want us to see is that craving for righteousness results in satisfaction. Look at verse 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The beauty of this verse. God is saying, you want righteousness you want more of me in your life you want to be in right standing a right relationship with me you're hungry for that come to me and i will satisfy you you ever have those moments where you're walking through and there's a sin in our lives that just keeps eating at us and we get disappointed or angry it's like man i'm tired I'm, i did it again i failed again I said that thing I shouldn't have said, trying to get a hold of my tongue. I fell into yet another temptation. God, I'm tired of this. I'm sick of this. God, I just want to be right. I just want you to make me right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, the Bible tells us that seeking God's righteousness is one of the very first things that we should seek and desire as believers. Go to Matthew 6. Listen to what it says, starting in verse 25. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, not about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. What God's word is saying to us 
is that what we need to have a craving for, a hungering for, is the kingdom of God, God ruling and reigning in our lives and a desire to be righteous and right with him. He said, seek those things first and God will take care of the rest. So let us hunger and crave for righteousness. If we do, we will be blessed because God's word promises we will be satisfied. Those moments when we're frustrated that we cannot, that we struggle beating those different sins. I can think back in my life how it took years and years for God to help me overcome different sins. And I think of present battles today and past being prologue gives me faith that God will be faithful to continue that work. But when you're struggling and you're frustrated, know there is wonderful news. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. God is the one who will satisfy and supply our righteousness. When we're hungering for it, you feel like I just can't hit that standard of perfection. I once had a guy, I remember in college, and it's funny because he, char- he was a very charismatic brother. This big, big African-American gentleman named Bishop Lashaw. He came from a very charismatic background. He looked at me and he said, Brother Jared, he said, you have one problem. He said, you're trying so hard to climb the next rung on the spiritual ladder. He said, you are stressed out and you are just trying so hard to be perfect. He said, what you need to do is you need to go spend time with the Lord. You need to be refreshed and draw near to him. And he'll take care of the rest. And I remember talking to Mr. Bashan. He had me pegged. He had me pegged. He had to get to the sermon, I'll tell you that. Because he had me pegged. I was trying so hard to be righteous. I'd start my morning and look myself in the mirror and be like, you're not going to cuss today. You're not going to do that today. You're going to do what you're supposed to do. You're going to live godly. You're not going to think that. You're not going to do that. And I was trying all of my flesh to do these things and climb this next rung on the spiritual ladder. You know what it made me? It made me a bitter, judgmental Pharisee that I was trying in my own power. But God is the one who supplies my righteousness. What I should have done is I should have drawn near to God and let the Holy Spirit convict me on certain sin and let God work on my heart. When I fail and fall short, I should have rested in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifest or brought, brought about apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The good news is that when I fall short and fail, I can rest on Jesus Christ because he is my righteousness. I hunger and thirst to be more holy, more godly, more righteous, and that is a good thing. What I have to remember is that my righteousness comes from God. I have to go to him and let the Holy Spirit search my heart and deal with my sin. And when I get frustrated with my sin, I have to rest in the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. It all boils down to dependence upon God. So let's see how dependence upon God comes through these Beatitudes. Look at verse 3. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are desperately in need of God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn over their sin and wickedness and the brokenness of this world, for they shall be comforted as passive. They shall be comforted by God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, because it's God who watches over them. It's God who will provide. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Jesus Christ satisfies what I could not be and do. And the practical righteousness of my life comes from the Holy Spirit doing his work in you and I. So dear church family, as we begin this study of Christianity 101, let us know that the blessed life is a life in which we are utterly dependent upon God. 
But if you're here today and you tell me, Jared, I've been born in church, I've been born and raised in church. I've been going to church before I was born. You say here that I've been a good person, I've done many good things, and all of these wonderful works are going to somehow get me grace with God. Don't be that Pharisee who thinks that you're going to earn your way to heaven. God's standard is absolute perfection. Are you Jesus? If not, you and I will not make the cut. But the great news is that Jesus on the cross is willing to take our place. Our sin and failure is punished on the cross if we believe in Jesus. But the Bible also teaches that his righteousness, his perfect record, is applied to us. That when God sees sinful, broken me, he sees Jesus' blood that covers my sin. And he sees a perfect child of God through Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you need him to be made right with God. If you want to know more about that, please feel free to come talk to me. If you need prayer, want to talk about anything else, I'll be right down here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, God, I thank you that you are our everything. Even to preach this sermon, God, it is by your absolute grace, God, that you enable me to preach this word. You enable any of us, God, to live this life. So, Lord Jesus, God, help us run to you. Help us be desperate and dependent upon you. God, will you be our everything so that we may truly live a blessed and pleasing life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.